Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the gifts of this day. We thank you for the many blessings which you bestow upon us. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your love. We thank you for our families, for our friends, and for this group. Lord, we ask that you tear down any walls that are holding us back, that you open up our hearts and help us to realize just how much you truly love us. Give us everything that we need, body, mind, and soul. We pray for those who do not know you, that you will reach out to them, and that you will give them the grace and the strength to turn to your infinite mercy. And we ask all of this with the help and intercession of our guardian angel, St. Avery, St. Joseph, and the Blessed Virgin Mary, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, as we pray. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Thank you guys so much again for letting me speak here tonight. I am like super, super, super excited. So, I'm going to just talk about, about a couple things real quick tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about my conversion into the Catholic Church, the power of the Holy Rosary, and in particular, giving God our best, um, in particular, through the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, right? So just a little bit about me. Um, oh, wait, I forgot to share one good thing about me. Um, that happened to me this week. Um, mass was wonderful, and I'm actually just super excited to be with here, here with all of you guys. So, <coughs> again, my name is John Holland. I um, grew up and still live in Fort Warmie. Um, I have a beautiful wife, and we're raising two beautiful boys right now. We've got another beautiful baby that's coming, expecting and um, due in February. <laughs> I've lived in Fort Laurie my whole life. Um, but I have not actually always been a Catholic. We moved to Fort Laurie when I was around probably three years old. And um, my mom's from Indiana, my dad's from Southern Ohio. Long story short, they ended up moving to Sydney, meeting in Sydney, and migrating to Fort Laurie. And they've stayed there like ever since. And in particular, just because the community is so phenomenal, right? These small communities that we have in this area are like, they're phenomenal. Like they really, really, really are. So I want to start off with a, a scripture passage from John. And that is John 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So I think there's a reality that we all have to come to terms with and that we all have to accept is that we actually all, every single one of us, has what's called like a God-sized hole in our hearts, right? Like it's literally this God-sized hole in our hearts. And the only person who can ever fill that hole that we have in our hearts is him himself, is our Lord, right? But oftentimes we are, we try to fill that hole with something different, something that, you know, just, we try to fill it. So I grew up in Fort Laramie. Um, like I said, my mom and dad were not Catholic, but uh, I always wanted to be Catholic. Um, you know, they're, they're, the church is right next door to the school, and I remember as a little kid just looking up at the church and just being absolutely amazed by it. Like, it's just so beautiful. And I would hear about my friends uh, that were going to whatever it may be with religion or, um, you know, First Communion, even though I, you know, I didn't know those things, confession, those things like that. I'd hear them talking about things. I didn't know what it was, but I was always drawn to it. And like, it was like, there's, there's something about the Catholic faith that I just, I'm drawn to. The first time I actually ever got to go into the church was when I was um, in fourth grade. And I was blown away. And like, just of the beauty. Just how incredible it was. And it's like, it's almost like, I was just a little kid, but like, you could tell it's like, this is not God must live here, right? I didn't really get it at the time, but like later I soon found out. Um, so like I said, um, we all do have this God-sized hole in our hearts. Growing up, I recognized that there was a hole in my heart as well. And like many other people, I didn't know what it was, but I knew something was missing. And like many other people, I would fill it with things just to try to try to fill that void that makes any sense. I'm longing for something. We're all longing for something. We're made for more. And I was one of those people that was filling my heart with other things, trying to trying to fill that void that I felt. 
Does that make sense? I recognize the hole, and um, like I said, I was, I was putting things in it that, that shouldn't have been. I started dating this girl in high school, and she's now my wife. And um, we started dating just before my senior year. And she's one of the best blessings that's ever happened to me. She's a cradle Catholic, um, but she was one that didn't really, like many people, right, I don't know if she really got a strong catechesis growing up like in religion class and so on and so forth. Right? There's a lot of people who fall into that. So she wasn't like super, super into her faith, right? But she did have like this, like it meant something to her, and that was really attractive to me too. And so we started dating, and we were, um, you know, we're pretty, pretty serious. We got engaged in 2013, and then we ended up getting married in 2015. And it was such, such, a, such a blessing. Um, one of the things before we got married that we wanted is we always talked about like. You know, as we raise a family, we want everybody to be in unison, if that makes any sense. We, want, we don't want dad having this, I, I, did, I was like a non-practicing Protestant. Mom and dad gave us a lot of good values, right? Instilled a lot of good traditions and things like that, right? But I definitely did not have the fullness of the Catholic Church. Well, as we got engaged, we talked about how, you know, we want our family to be under one faith. It makes sense, right? The way dad's not going this way, mom's not going this way, and our kids are back in the background like, what's going on? You know, so we made that decision. We wanted to be, you know, under one faith. And obviously, I was drawn to the Catholic faith. So I decided I'm going to join RCIA, right? I, so I, I joined RCIA right after I was, um, right after we got married um, in 2015. Sorry, need a little bit of water. Um, and I was absolutely blown away with some of the things that we learned. Some of the things that we talked about, some of the, the, the beauties that were unveiled, right? Like the truths. I didn't share this yet, but actually, before all joining RCIA, I actually, RCIA, I actually had a really good friend that um, I met playing beer league softball. <laughs> beer league softball is great, by the way. <laughs> He's awesome. You guys, a lot of you guys probably know him. His name is Matt Gibson. Does that name ring a bell? He spoke here once. Yeah, pretty awesome. But he was one. Of, he was a friend that actually, before kind of like the train really got growing, rolling, he was able to set some some stepping stones in place for me. And one of the some of the things that he shared with me was, um, he's like John. He's like I love my brothers and sisters. I love them. <laughs> but there's something more. There's there's something more. And he shared with me that, like you know, Jesus really only he wanted he wanted one church. He only wanted one. And so he was able to kind of plant those seeds, and they, they stuck, right? It took a while before they actually blossomed, but they stuck. So I joined RCAA in 2015, and things were going good. Things were going good. But like I said, um, I had not, like, in my life, I was putting things in that God-sized hole that I had. I was filling it with things that I shouldn't. I used to like to drink a lot, like a lot. <laughs> like, it, like, I used to like to drink a lot. And I used to do a lot of other, you know, things that were not of God as well. Um, so as I'm, I joined RCIA, right, a lot of, like I said, the veil is starting to be torn a little bit. And I'm starting to get open to some of the beautiful and awesome realities of the Catholic Church. But I hadn't necessarily, like, jumped in with both feet yet. I still had a lot of questions. I still didn't understand everything, right? <coughs> Until um, <coughs> came a time in January... Well, actually, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. At the beginning of January, something very tragic happened to me. I had actually lost um, my childhood best friend, and he had died of drug overdose. I didn't even really know that he had a, a drug problem, I'll be honest. But he died of drug overdose, and this rocked my world. He was like my best friend growing up from like the age of three till we were in high school. Um, like my best, best friend. And I'm going through RCIA and I'm learning about the faith. And um, you know, like heaven and hell are real things, right? Like they, they are real things. And ultimately, one day we are all going to be in one or the other. So like my mind instantly starts going to like, what happened to my friend? 
there's, there's, this is a good, this is a good story. So, so don't get like all sappy and stuff like that. No, no, no. Like, there's book lays tremendous fruit with this. So that night, my world got rocked, and I felt something placed. I, I believe it's the Holy Spirit placed on my heart that night. I didn't know how to pray the Rosary yet, um, but I did recently learn how to pray the Hail Mary. But it was placed on my heart. Just pray the Hail Mary. So I sat in bed that night for a tremendous amount of time, just praying the Hail Mary over and over and over and over again. Tears streaming down my eyes. Just for my time. I didn't even know what I was doing. So I'm just like, I'm just praying the Hail Mary. Right? We talked about, I said that this tonight's talks are gonna be kind of like layered among things. One, my conversion story, one and, and also in particular, um, the rosary and, and our blessed mother. Our blessed mother loves you so much. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he actually entrusted Mary to be our heavenly mother. You know, when he was on the cross, he said, woman, behold your son. And he looked at his beloved disciple and he said, behold your mother. And that is the moment when Jesus entrusted Mary to be your heavenly mother as well. At that hour, you see the disciple takes her into his home. And he says yes to the gift that Jesus entrusted and gave to him. Mary loves you so much. She loves me so much. How many of you guys, let me ask you guys this question. If your mom, growing up, she ever asked you to do anything, right? She made, the, made a request for you. What do you think you're going to do? She said, you know, Brandon, can you take out the trash for me? What do you think, what are you going to do, Brandon? Absolutely. Yeah. You're going to do it. You're going to do it, right? If she says, Sarah, can you, um, can you, can you help your brother out with so-and-so, right? What are you going to do, Sarah? You're probably going to do it. You're probably going to do it, right? I do not believe it is possible for Jesus to say no to his mother. I do not believe it's possible. One, because her will is in total conformity and unity with her son's will. She is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. I do not believe it is possible for Jesus to say no to his mother. And so when we go to her, right, and she brings our petitions to God, you have got to believe and know that that is extremely powerful. So my, I had lost my best friend in this tragic accident, or this tragic circumstance. And like I said, I finally, I like really got on my knees and like, like went to our Lord in prayer, turned to our lady. I didn't even know what, what, and what I was doing. And shortly after that, I actually had another friend that I had another deep conversation with. But it was um, a little bit different than the one with Matt. This guy was a little bit more hard-hitting to me. And he's a good friend of mine. And he basically kind of told me, he's like, John, he's like, you can't be a cafeteria Catholic. He's like, it's all of it or none of it. <coughs> all of it or none of it. The Catholic faith is like an onion. This is an analogy. It's an, it might be a bad one, I don't know. But with each layer that you peel back, it gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. It's incredible. But you have to say yes to all of it. You can't pick and choose what you want. Even if there's some mystery meat in the middle and it looks a little funky, right? <laughs> what is that, bro? <laughs> Even if you don't understand what it is, right? Church says that you must believe this. You must believe it. Just trust it. Jesus said, I will give to Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven, right? The church has the authority to teach definitively. Now, that does not mean that everything that comes out of Pope Francis' mouth is dogma. No. What that means is when he teaches definitively, when the Pope teaches definitively, when the magisterium teaches definitively, we believe, right? And yes, we can see to learning that, like, why do we believe that? What's the reason for it? Well, we believe it. You just, you sent your book to it, right? So I had a friend that he, like, literally, you know, kind of dropped the mic on me. John, you can't be a cafeteria Catholic. John, it is a mortal sin to miss mass. <laughs> like, it is, a, it is a mortal sin, right? You can't reject the church's teaching that, contra like, you can't, you can't, like, say yes to contraception. The church teaches contraception is a big no-no. You can't, like, reject that. 
It's all of it or none of it. This rocked my world. <laughs> because like I said, I was, you know, he said things like, you can't go out and get drunk. That again, it's a mortal sin. If done with deliberate consent and full knowledge, right? It's so like rock my world because I had, I was in this place where I had to choose. I had to say yes to his loving invitation. Or I had to say no. Like I said, it's all of it or nothing. Um, by the grace of God, I was able to say yes. You know, I went to the confession the first time when I was 25 years old. And let me tell you something. I had a lot of stuff. <laughs> I had a lot of baggage, right? Like a lot. And I was pretty nervous. Like I was, I was pretty nervous. I was really nervous. <laughs> But you want to know something that I found out? That Jesus is not waiting for us in the confessional with a club ready to beat us up. <laughs> the priest is what's in called persona Christi. Christ works through the priest. You know, he said, who sins you forgive or forgiven them? Who sins you retain or retain? He literally gave the apostles the power to forgive sins through him, right? They for, um, through Christ. Christ works through them, right? And that lineage that was given to the apostles traces all the way to our current bishops today and extends now to our priests, right? The sacrament of confession is biblical. In fact, the Bible is a Catholic book. The Catholic Church is, are the ones who gave us the Bible. Okay. So I went to the first my sacrament of confession when I was 25 years old. And Jesus is not, he wasn't in there. Like, he's like, oh, here comes John, you know. That rotten sinner, I know what he's done, you know. I got my club, I'm gonna get him. <laughs> I'm gonna get him. Nope. Not at all. He is not waiting for you with the club, he is waiting for you with a hug. I know that sounds a little cheesy, but it is the truth. If you were the only person that was ever created in the entire world, Jesus would have went through everything on Calvary just for you. Just for you. That's how much you mean to him. That's how much he loves you. He looks at you with infinite love, and he says, I thirst. You want to know what that thirst is? He thirsts for your soul. He thirsts for your love in return. He wants you to come to the fountain of his mercy. And the diary of St. Faustina, I'm paraphrasing, but I believe he says, um, the flames of mercy are burning me. He wants people to take them from him. He wants people to accept his mercy. But so many people are like, nope, sorry. I found this out. <laughs> Jesus is not waiting for us with a club, rather with a hug. You know? And by the grace of God, I was able to say yes to the faith. I was brought into the church in 2016, and it's been awesome ever since. I'm not saying it's easy. It's actually tough, right? Life in general is tough, whether you're being faithful to the gospel or not. But with the cross, there is a resurrection. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so, kind of get back into a little bit. I'm going to change the subject for a little bit. So, I was able to say yes to this invitation. Um, you guys remember me telling you that I, my family's Protestant. My family's Protestant. I'm talking about the rosary, the power of the rosary. Okay? carry this bad boy almost everywhere I go. In fact, I sleep with rosary in my pocket with joy. Some people may think it's weird. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. I carry it everywhere I go. Pray it every day. My family was not Catholic, though. And when you have something so good, when you have the truth of the gospel, right, you want to share that with everybody. Like, you want everybody to experience the love, the mercy, and the fullness of life that Jesus offers. So I start praying the rosary for my family. My family's great. I love them. I love them. I hope they watch this tonight. So <laughs> start praying the rosary for my family. And through that rosary, I'm like, bless them, mother. I'm like, please bring my family to the church. You guys want to know something awesome that happened? I was brought into the church in 2016. In 2017, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my entire family also came into the Catholic church. All of them. And it is not me, it is our Lord and our Blessed Mother. 
Now, do you guys remember me telling you about my friend that passed away? You guys remember me saying that? Pretty, pretty hard hitting stuff. And I, I'm thinking, like, what happened to my friend? Is he saved? Is he in hell? Like, I'm just going to be honest. What happened to him? I love him so much. Well, do you guys know something? We are in time. God is outside of time, though. He can take your prayers right now that you say today at this moment, and he can place them wherever he wants in the spectrum of time. Wherever. He can take a prayer that I said today, and he can apply it 100 years ago, 500 years, whatever, however, wherever it is. Right? And know that God wants your salvation, our salvation, more than we want it ourselves. Do you guys remember me telling you that night they passed away? I turned to Our Lady, not even knowing what I meant, but like what I was doing. Okay. Well, I'm sometimes I struggle with not trusting our Lord, but I went to our Lord in prayer, and I was like, you know what? I really want my best friend saved. Like I really do. Can you tell me what happened to him? I want to know. I'm praying for him. I'm praying to Chapel and Divine Mercy for him. I want to know. Um, not all too long after that, I have this very real dream. You don't have to believe this, right? You don't have to believe this. But I'm just telling you what happened, okay? I had this very real dream. And in this dream, I was talking to my friend. And the impression that I got was that he's okay. God had provided him the graces necessary for salvation. He, he, he can provide those graces right before his death. And he can have that conversion, right? I got the impression that he was okay. I got, you know, I believe that Our Lady was praying for him. And like I said, I do not believe that it's possible for Jesus to say no to his mom. It's hard for you, for any of us, to say no to our moms. But, like, could you, can you really say no to the Immaculate Virgin, to the one who is without sin? Can you? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I had this really very real dream. And I got the impression that he was okay. And I asked him, I said, what's God like? And the impression was that I got that you can't even imagine. Can't even imagine. So I wake up, things are awesome, swimming in constellations, life's great. But like I said, I struggle with trust a lot. I struggle with trust. And when all too long afterwards, I'm like, all right, Lord, thank you, like, thank you for that dream. But I want to know. I want to know what happened to my friend. Like, I really do. And here's what I want. I want you, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you, you guys all do this because it may not be good. But it's like, I want you to give me an idiot-proof answer. Like, something that's idiot-proof, right? Something that, like, I can't, like, like, it's like, He's like, and here's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on his Facebook page, and I want you to show me something on his Facebook page and let me know that he's saved. I, I want something idiot proof. Like I said, I'm not suggesting that you guys all do this, but what happened was pretty crazy. He used to write things about football games all the time on Facebook. Page, on Facebook. And as I'm looking at his page, one of the things that popped up, remember I said, I want something idiot-proof, idiot-proof. One of the things that popped up was, he was talking about a football game, I think it was about A.J. Green, um, but at the end of it, he's like, wow, I can't believe the Hail Mary worked. Do you guys remember what I prayed for that night? Over and over. She take care of you. She will take your hand. And she will bring you to her son. And if she intercedes for you, you're in good shape. <laughs> you are in really, really, really good shape. She loves you so much. She wants us to turn to her. And she wants, not like pointed to Jesus, she wants us to turn to her. And she wants us to turn to him. And she's, she wants to bring us to him. So I encourage you to actually do that. If you don't pray the rosary, take up this practice. This is a sword in the spiritual battle. I once asked, I, Ben said, I'm, uh, he mentioned that, that I'm the youth minister at Holy Angels. I once asked, I was talking about the rosary, um, and this rosary literally slays dragons. 
I was once using this analogy to a sixth grader. I was like, when you guys were little, I was like, did you guys ever pretend that you were like beating up the bad guy, right? This little sixth grader's like, I still do that. <laughs> <laughs> you are awesome. <laughs> With this rosary, you will like literally. She will. She will slay. She's gonna slay the dragon. If she hasn't already. Okay. Like th this is extremely, extremely powerful. This is, in a sense, the gospel on beads. <laughs> so pray this rosary. Pray, pray the rosary. And by the grace of God, like I said, I was able to embrace the faith, and it's been an awesome journey ever since. Um, so wherever you're at right now, we're gonna take a little bit of a break here soon. And we're going to bring it back again. But my encouragement to you, in all sincerity, is to say yes to getting your invitation. It will be the best ride that you ever go on. It won't be easy. Life isn't easy, right? So just get that out of your head. <laughs> it's not. But it will be the best adventure that you ever go on. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your church. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you for your love. Help us to know of that love. Help our brothers and sisters to know of your love. And help us to turn to you for trust. We thank you, we love you, and we honor you. Give us everything that we need. And help us to love you in return. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everybody, so much. So, I gotta ask you guys this question. Um, well, actually, before I ask the question, we're gonna start out with um, another scripture verse. So, Luke twelve forty nine. I came to cast fire upon the earth, and would that it were already kindled. Has anybody ever heard that before? Okay, so I've heard, I've kind of gotten like two versions of this, right? One of the versions that I got was the fire that he wants is being absolutely, the fire of the Holy Spirit, being absolutely in love with Jesus. Like being set on fire, right? You guys have heard that term before, right? If you're on fire for the Lord. Lord. So let's, let's read that again. Let's listen to that again. I came to cast fire upon the earth, and would that it were already kindled. He wants you guys to be a fire of a love for him. He wants his light to shine through you guys. He really does. And let me tell you something. If it does, people are going to be attracted to that. It will. It will. All right, I gotta ask you guys this question, right? And I want you to be honest with me. Just, just be totally honest with me. Um, just say that Jesus Christ was going to be somewhere. Just say he was going to be out in the parking lot, right? He was going to be someplace <coughs> at, just say, tonight at nine o'clock, um, and he's actually going to be there, present, like Savior of the world, God Himself. He's going to be there. What would you do? Would you show up? Like, if literally the Savior of the world, the same Jesus that died for you on Calvary was going to be somewhere, what would you do? Would you show up? Yes. Would you tell people? Would you tell people? Would you get excited? You would probably get a little bit nervous. <laughs> right? No. How would you dress? How would you act? Would it be all like super casual and like, yeah, what's up, bro? Or would it be like, I love you, right? And I think everybody's like on the same page. Like, yes, we would. We would give God our all. 
we would give him our all. Because like you look at him and his suffering, his crucifixion was for you. Was for you. And we ought to give him our best in return. Right? Just we, we need to give him our best. So I don't know if you guys <coughs> um, but there's this another story, right? It's about this guy who was a Protestant, and he heard that Jesus Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. He heard about this, right? But like, you know, he never really like grasped this. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna go to Mass, right? And I, I want to see what, what exactly you're talking about. So he went to this church. He didn't even actually go into church, but like there was like these windows, and he actually just watched. And he heard that Jesus was present in the Eucharist. And he's watching. He's watching. The priest notices that he's here. He's watching. And afterwards, <coughs> no way. Forget it. He comes back again. <coughs> he's another guy. He's watching. He's watching in the window. And he's like, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. No way. No way. And the priest comes up to him afterwards. He's like, you know, I saw you at Mass. He's like, why were you making those gestures? Like, why were you throwing your hand? Why were you so upset? He's like, I heard that Jesus Christ was truly present in the Eucharist. And he said, I don't believe it. He's like, if you guys truly believe that Jesus is present in the Eucharist, you would be crawling to that altar. You would be crawling to him. He's like, I didn't see any reverence. He's like, people were up there receiving him like he was some kind of common cookie. Like, really? He's like, you think that this is truly God? He's like, you people don't act like it. This is a story. Priest look at him. He's like, you're right. You know, I, I say that original story about if Jesus was like present in, you know, in a parking lot, like what would you do? You would, you would give him your all. Well, the beautiful reality is, is that Jesus is present in the Catholic Church. He's present in every single tabernacle. He comes to our altars. He is truly there, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And he looks at you with love. He's there. He's truly, 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 truly present. And we need to give him our best. What I'm going to talk about now, I'm going to, I'm, I'm already, I know it may prick some hearts. I know that. Um, it's not meant to be condemning at all. It's not meant to pick on people or, at all. No, this is meant to get us to become alive and awake to the awesome reality of Jesus in the Eucharist. He's literally down the hall from us right now, the Savior of the world. So where I'm speaking from tonight, just know this. This is to, to start these hearts on fire, right? If Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist, we need to give him our best. Did you guys know that, like, there's a study that was done, and approximately, like, only 70% of Catholics actually believe in the doctrine and the dogma of Jesus being truly present in the Eucharist? Like, only, like, approximately, let me see. Approximately 70% of Catholics actually believe that Jesus is present in the Eucharist. I don't know about you guys, but that breaks my heart. Like, that breaks my heart. I've heard a lot of people say, I went to the Latin Mass. I went to the Latin Mass. Kudos to that. I love the Latin Mass. I love it. <clears throat> right now, where we're at in the history of the church, you know, everybody's heard of beacons of light, right? It's not a priest shortage that's going on right now. What ultimately is happen, happening is what's called a crisis of faith. People don't know Jesus in the Eucharist. Like, they, right? People don't know the awesome realities of the church, right? And that's why, that's honestly why people do what we do sometimes. That's why I do what I do sometimes, right? It's because, like, you know, we're confused, right? And a lot of us really, the truth has not been unveiled to us yet. I want that veil to start being torn back a little bit. There's this phrase that I use a lot. And it goes, Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi. It's Latin. Does anybody know what it means? 
It means the law of worship is the law of belief. Or how we worship is how we believe, right? What we believe internally should also reflect externally in some degree. Does that make any sense? Like it, it, it should reflect it should reflect external. Like you should see it. Does anybody know a priest by the name of Father Ambrose? <laughs> he is a saint. <laughs> That's my opinion. Shortly after coming into the Catholic Church, I would go to a lot of his man of God things. Um, this is, it was a program designed for men to help strengthen men and their faith and help them, right? And I remember seeing this man has such a love for Jesus and the Eucharist. And when he was around the tabernacle, when he was around the altar, you could see his love for Jesus. Like you could see it. You could see that there were two hearts communicating. And that witness set my heart on fire. <laughs> because he's truly there. He loves you beyond what you can possibly imagine. In Matthew, I believe it said, Behold, I am with you till the end of the age. Jesus. Now, approximately 70% of people, Catholics, don't believe in the, like, the dogma, the doctrine of Jesus being truly present in the Eucharist. That's sad. That's really sad. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that goes into it. Some of the things that I think goes into it is poor catechesis. Like, there's a lot of people. They may be well-intended. Like, they really may be well-intended. But there's been a lot of people who just have not taught the faith maybe through, maybe because of a lack of knowledge, maybe because of a lack of um, whatever it may be. Maybe they've intentionally tried not to teach the faith. Wolves in sheep's clothing. I mean, that the gospel warns us of that, actually, that there will be wolves in sheep's clothing, right? Excuse me. Our externals have to reflect what we believe internally. Like they do. Do you guys remember what I said about this in the story that man said he would be crawling to that altar? He would get down on your knees and pray. And the priest said, You're right. You're right. You're right. I want to um, share a little something with you guys share something with you guys. So, I, like I said, this may prick hearts, and it's not meant to, like I said, it's not meant to bash anybody. But there is this, like I said, I mentioned there, it could be poor catechesis, why people don't believe in what the church teaches. It also could be kind of watered down liturgy. Like things that are done that shouldn't be done. I'm not going to be up here bashing priests. I don't like to do that, right? But like, watered down liturgy, right? So, I want to share something with you about my, about how we should, one of, how we should receive communion. I'll just say it, right? Because I 1,000% endorse, 1,000% endorse receiving, receiving Jesus and kneeling and on the tongue. The reason why I say that, there's a lot of reasons for that, right? There's a lot of reasons for that. Number one, kneeling, because it's God. <laughs> like, this is literally the Savior of the world. Right? And if we receive the holiest of holies, like ordinary food, there is this possibility that we can perceive that it's ordinary food. If that makes any sense. The parishes that are really thriving right now, I'm a youth minister for all ages, so I see things, right? The parishes that are really, really thriving right now, are the parishes where the liturgy has, is much more orthodox and purified, if that makes any sense. Um, I'm not just bragging because I go, I um, work for Holy Angels, but they have four men in seminary right now. Four from one parish. St. Remy's has two men in seminary right now. It's a very small town. They have one man that was just ordained not too long ago. 
Why are men flocking to the seminary at parishes like that? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's because of how beautiful the liturgy is. Like, really. Like, people get it. People, people see it. They understand it. At St. Remy's, they, and Holy Angels, they used patents when people receive communion, basically. They'll put it under your tongue or under their hands in case fragments don't get, like, fall, and then they could catch them. That actually says something, though, when you use those patents. Um, they have kneelers out there. That way people are invited to kneel down before Jesus. You can still kneel on the carpet. That's totally okay. That's great. But they have kneelers that allow people to, to kneel, make it very comfortable and welcoming to kneel before Jesus. <clears throat> um, not too long ago, I was holding um, my one-year-old, right, Elijah. And he's a little squirmy little guy. And my four-year-old Simon was like, Dad, have a cheese it. I'm like, I got my hands full. I'm like, Simon, I, I got my hands full right now. He's like, Dad, how'd cheese it? He's like, no, I, I got my hands full right now, Simon. I'm sorry. He's like, right, Dad, Dad, come on, come on, have this cheese it. I was like, and I'll tell you what, Simon. I was like, he's four, mind you. He's four. I was like, you give me that cheese it. I was like, give me the cheese it, how Mommy and Daddy receive cheese it. You want to know what he does? He takes this cheese it and he instantly puts it on my tongue. He knew exactly what I was talking about. He's four. Like he doesn't he doesn't understand transubstantiation, all those things. Right? Like he's actually, like, that, that, that's not his vocabulary yet. But he gets it. At least to a degree, right? He gets it. And I asked Simon, I was like, Simon, why do mommy and daddy kneel and receive Jesus? These are his words, not mine, okay? But don't bash him because he's four. He's coming from a four-year-old's mouth. You want to know what he says? He's like, because we love him. And if we don't, I'm getting mad. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, but like, I, the reason why I share that story is because, like, this four-year-old kid, he gets it, though, right? He's not theologian. He doesn't understand things. But he's like, there's something special up there. Mommy and Daddy receive him differently. He, they don't receive him like ordinary food. So he doesn't think that it's ordinary food. Does that make any sense? Lex Arani, Lex Redeni. How we worship is how we believe, right? So it's a good thing to kneel before the Savior of the world. Why do you think it is? Does it actually, before we get into this, does anybody actually know the teaching the ordinary form, or the, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the correct verbiage, um, the, the normal way to receive Jesus in the universal churches, do you think it's on the tongue or in the hand? Mm, on the tongue. On the tongue. That's actually the universal norm. Some countries have what is called an indult that allows people to receive in the hand. Within that indult, though, there's also like this, like, there's like this sheet of things that you're supposed to observe. And actually, sometimes a priest, um, he can actually deny people receiving in the hand if there's the danger of desecrating our Lord. But a priest can never, never deny you receiving Jesus on the tongue. And if they do, you should say something to them with charity. If they push back, you may have to go elsewhere. I, I, I say that in all sincerity, but like, you know, fortunately, this area is pretty great. Like, it is really great. I can't speak for every parish because I don't know a lot of the parishes out in like Mercer County area, right? But most of the priests in this area are pretty great. They're pretty good. But that actually is the universal norm, right? You guys, I want to tell you a little story actually that broke my heart once. Um, I try not to pay attention all too much to people at Mass when they're receiving Jesus. But there is this time not all too long after I converted, though, when I'd watched where I was with the Christian, it was just for a little bit. What I saw, I saw this man go up to receive Jesus, put him in his mouth, went down like this, and took his hand back, and I saw something fall from his hand. The church teaches that after the consecration, every single particle is Jesus. Even if the, if the host is broken, it's still Jesus, right? It's still Jesus. Every particle is Jesus. 
watch the man proceed to drop the scene. And I saw something fall to the man. After Mass, I went over there. And sure enough, it was our Lord. It was the Savior of the universe on the ground. Just like my heart was broken. My heart was broken. So that is actually one of the reasons why I actually strongly encourage one of the reasons, communion on the tongue, is because if you receive on the tongue, like you really do take away a lot of those possibilities. Does that make any sense? Like there is that possibility that particles can stick to your hand. And if you're not checking your hands and like consuming afterwards, like like it's a strong possibility. It really is. So like I 1,000% encourage people to receive on the tongue, 1,000%. Um, and if you believe that it is Jesus, you won't have any excuse kneeling for him. Now I, I shared with you um, Father Amberger, right, and just watching his presence around the tabernacle, watching his love for Jesus in the Eucharist. And I was drawn to that. Like what, what do you have that, that so many other people are looking for? And it's a true relationship with God. Two hearts communicating. Two hearts communicating. Um, no, and it is also important to, let me ask you, actually I want to ask, so I don't want to beat a dead horse on this, but I do want to ask, how many, is anybody in here married? Anybody engaged? Okay, a lot of people engaged. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Tommy's like, you better have. <laughs> um, for you girls that are engaged, just think about this. And for any future lady, any ladies in here also, right? When we receive Jesus, we receive all of heaven. And in a sense, that is our marriage with heaven. How many of you ladies, if your fiance went up to you and he said, will you marry me? And he dropped the ring in your hands. I'm serious. He dropped the ring in your hands. Will you marry me? What would you do? You'd probably be like, what the? <laughs> like, put the ring on my finger, bro. <laughs> like, seriously, like, that makes sense, right? That, like, like, put the ring on your finger. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. You see? So it also makes sense, too, for the Lord, who works through the priest, for the priest to put Jesus on your tongue. Does that make sense? Do you guys see the analogy? Do you guys see, see how this works together? Okay? Okay. Analogy number two. This one's really weird. <laughs> Say on your wedding day that, I'm just because just you're my friend, I'm going to use this. <laughs> I'm going to use you as an example. He's like, yo, Steven, come up here. Come up here, bro. Come up here. And when you, when you say you're giving your I do's, you put the wedding ring in Steven's hand, and then Steven puts the wedding ring on Tara's finger. You think that's weird? Yes. <laughs> you think that's weird? I think it's really weird. <laughs> like, that's weird. So I like to receive Jesus from a priest, right? Because I want to receive the groom. The church is considered the bridegroom, and Jesus is the groom. Does that make any sense? So I want to receive God from God. Does that, do you guys see what I'm saying? I don't want, right, Jesus to be putting, I don't want the priest to be putting, like, given, you know, an extraordinary minister, a bowl of hosts, and then some person out in the, out in the, out in the pews to give me Jesus. That just doesn't make sense to me. Like, it doesn't. Now, it is allowed, and there are good things that have come through, like, allowing lay people to um, give people our Lord. Like, there are good things, like, hospitals and, you know, you know, those rare circumstances, so on and so forth, right? But it makes sense, right, to receive your groom from the priest. It would be weird if Ben put his wet, that wedding ring that's intended for Tara in some guy's hand, and then or some gal's hand, and then she put that wedding ring on Tara. Like, it just, like, like, whoa, like, no, <laughs> like that, no way, no way. So it makes sense, too, to receive Jesus from the priest. From the priest. Um, and two, it, it is so that I've, I've talked a lot about how to receive Jesus and like giving him our best, right? Like, and if you haven't like been doing this practice, number one, the first thing that's the most important before we receive Jesus is to make sure you're in a state of grace. Because if you're not in a state of grace, you got more sin on your soul. 
You should not go to Holy Communion. You should not go to Holy Communion. We talk about 70% of people don't believe in Catholic, or don't believe in the real presence, approximately. But do you ever see that mass? 70% of the people sitting back in the pews? No. You see the majority going up there. That's a problem, actually. Like, it really is a problem. It's one of the requirements. Like, it's, it's actually, it's a serious sin not to believe what the church teaches. Right? So, like, there has been such a, so much havoc that has been brought about, in particularly in the liturgy, and a lot of it is through wolves and sheep's clothing. Right? There's a lot of priests who actually have a terrible agenda. There's a lot of fantastic priests that are simply being obedient, um, doing what they can do, right? But, like, the liturgy really needs to be purified. Fortunately, in this area, like I said, we've got a lot of awesome priests. Awesome, awesome priests. Um, but I want to, you know, in particular, like, participating at Mass, right? So people are, like, participating at Mass. Okay, what's that mean? What's that mean? Okay. I'm going to pass out bulletins at the end of Mass. That's great. That's cool. Like, thank you. If you do that, that is great. That is great. But that's not, like, that's not exactly what participation is. Like, or I'm going to be a greeter. Okay, that's good. That's really good to welcome people. Like, there's a lot of people that welcome me. Like, what's your name again? Ryan. Ryan. No, it's Josh, isn't it? Josh Bell? Yeah. He came up to me, and he's like, Josh. And I'm like, John. Or like, oh, it's good to meet you, Josh. I'm like, and I find out his name's Ryan, actually, later. But he greeted me, right? So that's good. That's good. Like, I'm not bashing that those things. Those things are good. But real participation is giving your heart to Jesus. <clears throat> At every single Mass, the veil of time is torn, and we are literally on Calvary. We're present at the crucifixion. We are there. <laughs> we are there. And so, like I said, our externals, we need to, we need to pay attention. We need to, to give God our hearts, to offer up our, our sacrifices, our good works, our needs, right? In union with Christ's sacrifice for us. And we need to love him. He loves you. He loves you so much. He looks at you and he would have went through everything on Calvary just for you. We do need to give God our best, though. Um, I want to tell you a little, another story, actually. And it's actually about my son. <laughs> and it, 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 it kind of goes along with why we need to give God our best. It wasn't all too long ago. We were at a weekday mass. And my wife and I, we, we do try to give God all. We're not perfect, right? Like sometimes, like we're not perfect. Like sometimes I do get a little distracted at mass. I do, okay? We're not perfect. It's okay. We try to give him mass. And we were at mass, and I just you know, had praying hands, right? Just trying to pray along with the mass. Trying to internally pray along, right? All of a sudden, my son starts going, Dad, stop! Dad, stop! Stop, stop! It's like, what? And he looks around. He's looking around. And I was a weirdo at that point. You want to know why I was a weirdo? Because I was deep in prayer. And around me was like this. You know, it just, it was a, we were standing, like a bunch of people that looked like they were bored. <laughs> Mass is the least boring thing like, it's the least boring thing. Like I said, the veil of time is torn. We're on Calvary. No, it's the most incredible gift. But he, he looked at the surroundings. He's like, he thought I was a weirdo because like, I was in prayer and the people around us were not. He's like, Dad, stop. I was talking, you know, it's like, this is a problem. Because, like, my kids see this. Like, my little one sees this. And, like, I want him to know Jesus in the Eucharist. I want him to, like, I want him to give him this. It's like, this is a problem. We've really got to change the trajectory of things. Like, we do. We do. Oh, I had something else I want to show you. I'm totally forgetting it. Oh, yeah, one more thing. <laughs> so, it wasn't too long ago, too. 
we talk, we teach our kids, try to teach our kids faith, right? They're little. Elijah doesn't know much, so like, what we try to teach them is like, you know, things that Jesus said about you, you know, blowing kisses to to, to Mary, to Jesus, right? Saint Joseph, like little things, right? Um, and me and Simon were actually having this talk, like, you know, you know, only, only boys can be priests. Only boys can be priests. We were at mass, and the altar servers come out, come up, and my son goes. Dad! He's like, girls can't be fathers! <laughs> and I look back, and there's some altar girls there. That, like, right? And he doesn't know, he's four, right? But he's like, girls can't be fathers! <laughs> I know, bro. I know. Oh, boy. Um. You know, the purpose of serving Mass, right? And I'm not bashing any girls that have ever served Mass. I'm not doing that. Don't, don't take it as that. Please do not. Please do not. But one of the big purposes of serving at Mass is to introduce men to the priesthood. Women cannot be priests. Even if liberals try to shove this garbage down your throat, it ain't ever going to happen because Jesus never ordained a priest or never ordained a female. It didn't happen. It will never happen. Right? So it makes sense for men, for boys, to be altar boys. You guys with me? That might be a little hard for people to, to hear. Like, and like I said, I'm not bashing anybody if they've ever been a server. That's not what I'm saying. Some of the best servers actually are girls. Like, they, they do a phenomenal job. I know that. I know that. I know that. I know that. But, I'm just thinking, like, is it needed? Like, uh, should it just be boys? Like, I don't know. It's just my, it's what my psyche's telling me. Like, my, my brain. Like, so, does anybody have any questions, actually, with what I've been saying? Like, any questions at all? I will take them. Yes? Why do you think that man even went up to communion in the first place? That what? That guy who threw Jesus on the floor. I don't know. My guess is, in all sincerity, he probably doesn't understand his faith. A lot of people are like that, right? So you don't like, we don't bash them, right? If I started out a little bit like, like on fire, it's because I want to wake your guys' hearts up. Like, I do, I do. He probably didn't understand me. And that's where actually most people are, right? Most people have not been taught really the faith. Like, we're just, this is where we're at right now, right? And so that's my, that is my guess. It was a particle that stuck to his hand and fell to the ground. He probably didn't understand. So I'm not going to bash him and be like, you're such a terrible person. No, he's, he probably just doesn't get it. Right? And that's where a lot of people don't, don't get it. Right? Like, it's, but it is God. You know, the last thought he said, this is my body. This is my blood. He's truly present. Yes, Caleb. So you were talking about, like, with your family coming into the Catholic Church that you prayed the rosary for them. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, let's say, like, some of us have kind of lukewarm family members, mm -hmm. too. How do we approach, like, these conversations beyond praying for them? Beyond praying for them? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it is important. No conversion is going to happen unless there's a bridge of love first. Okay? Like, that just isn't going to happen. If Brad comes up to me and be like, and he's just like, John, you're such a terrible person. And he has a Bible in his hand. And he starts hitting me over the head with the Bible. He's like, you need to come to Jesus. It's like, bro, you're kind of weird. Like, I don't even know you. Like, you're like, friendship. Like, you know, like, you know. So the bridge of where convergence happens is like, there has to be that, that friendship, that love. Right? Getting to know people. Right? They have to trust you. And they have to know that you will what's best for them. So, yes, praying for them. Right? Um... And doing things that you know will be effective. So let me give you some clues. Any place you can put a divine mercy image, and I'm sincere about this, where somebody can just gaze upon that image, do it. Do it. I work at Holy Angels. Where Holy Angels Church is, is not necessarily the best neighborhood. Okay? There's a lot of... Um, it's, it's not necessarily the best neighborhood. It's a great, great place, right? But there's, it's not the greatest, best neighborhood. One of the things that we've done is try to place images of divine mercy in places where people can see. Actually, 
and taping it on windows, having a yard sign, right? And here's why. Jesus promises graces through this image. It's simple. And you also, we also are not, like, we don't know when somebody's conversion is going to take place. But Jesus did say in the diary of St. Faustina that the prayer most pleasing to him is the conversion of the prayer for the conversion of souls. And know that every time this prayer is prayed, that that prayer is answered. He also said in the diary of St. Faustina that only the soul that wants it, or I think St. Faustina said this actually, only the soul that wants it will be damned. Does that make any sense? Only the soul that wants it will be damned. Okay? We get to choose God by responding to his grace or not. Does that make any sense? So you pray for them. You do things that you know can be effective, right? You plant seeds where you can plant seeds. I have a friend. I once told me, right, that when he was young, um, you know, he may, I'm not saying he went up to receive Holy Communion at Mass, but say he was at a, a night of party, right, and woke up at somebody's house, right, and like, one of the things that he was saying is like, you know, I'm heading out for Mass. I'm like, you know, you say this to like some 19, 20 year old people, like, okay, yeah, I'm heading out for Mass, I'm, I gotta go to Mass. So, and that may seem simple, but in that moment, it's a seed. It's a seed. Also, praying in public. Not being weird about it, but like before meals, especially before meals in public. One of um, people in my conversion story became a Catholic. I wish I would share this earlier. No, actually, I'm glad I'm sharing it now. When I was out to eat, one of my, um, my best friend was getting married, and we were out to eat in the morning for breakfast. That's what often people do. Uh, before they get married, like the, the wedding party goes out to eat, right, with like the father and the father-in-law, right? And this man is awesome. This man is awesome. And when our food came, came out, when this food came out, we were having this conversation, and my buddy's father-in-law was like, hold up, I got a pray. He just, he stopped, made the sense, crossed, said grace right there. I was 23 years old at the time, and I remember thanking him. And say this. I'm like, bro, there are people in here. What are, you, what are you doing? But, but at the same time, it was actually like, wow, that is so admirable. That is so admirable. And that actually, like, that was a seed later that helped me. So sometimes it's not up to us when conversions happen, it's up to God. And you do what you can in the moment, right? And Whatever it may be, right? Know that conversions happen. If you love them, care for you, right? Like there, you need there needs to be a friendship, right? Like I said, Brad's hit me over the head with a book, and I don't even really know Brad that much. I'm just like, oh, bro, like you know, that's just not gonna work. It's a great question. Uh, did that answer? Yeah, okay. that's helpful. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Yes, Brandon. Would you want to expand on like? I love that you're talking about the Eucharist because like they can run through a brick wall and it's awesome. And I really <laughs> believe that the best parishes treat uh, the Eucharist with the most reverence. Yep. Uh, would you want to expand on too and talk maybe a little bit about altar rails and mm -hmm. like, what they do? Because maybe some people just don't know about altar rails and I think they're like very beautiful and wish they would free, be brought back. Yes, I am 1,000% on board with altar rails. What an altar rail is, is basically an, it's a rail right that has a kneeler before you enter the sanctuary, right? And it is extremely inviting to kneel down before Jesus in the Eucharist, where you kneel down, and the priest, what the priest will do, if you guys saw this at the Latin Mass, did, did they have an altar rail? They had kneelers. They had kneelers, okay. It. What the priest will do on an altar rail, though, is he will distribute our Lord, like, as people are, like, down on, and, like, it's super quick, super reverent, but he will go to, and he will, he will distribute our Lord to each people. Or to each person. Does that make any sense? That is an altar rail. And it's, it's extremely inviting because it's like you're then not the only one that's doing it. But even if you are the only one that's doing it or you're one of the few, that's totally okay. Totally okay. Absolutely it's okay. I saw a man at uh, Sacred Heart Parish. I'm not going to say his name. Good friend of mine. Um, but I remember seeing his reverence for the Eucharist too. And it was just like, planting seeds for other people. If other people see you kneel, they need to be like, why is it that you kneel? Why is it? And your response can be simple. Because I love God. I love my Savior. 
I love them. I love them. I love them in the uniform. That's why. Does that answer your question, Brandon? Yep. Good. Anybody else have any questions? Or questions? Yes, my friend. You mentioned earlier that you prefer receiving communion from the priest yes. directly. Yes. Was there ever a point in time when only the priest was allowed to mm -hmm. distribute communion? Yes. Yes, actually. Um, yes. People often get Vatican II confused. They say, like, oh, Vatican II did this. Vatican II allowed, um, they stripped away the altar rails. They want the priest to be facing the people rather than facing God in the tabernacle during the holy sacrifice of the Mass when the priest is speaking to God. Like, that makes sense. That makes sense. It doesn't make sense. Sorry, some people may not like this. It doesn't make sense to have your back turned towards Jesus in the tabernacle. Like, it, it just doesn't. That's what's called ad orientum worship, rather than... Um, um, Versus temporal. Um, yes. So, thank you, Brandon. Smart guy. Um, but yes, there was a time in where it was only the, the priest. Um, there's an allowance for it, and I don't think it's like the worst thing in the world, because like I said, there is some, some fruits that can come forth from it, right? So just say, like, there's somebody on their deathbed, and they need to receive, they want to receive Jesus, you know, before they're about to die, and the priest isn't available. So then so-and-so does have the ability to bring Jesus to them, right? Well, obviously you can see that there's fruit there in that, right? But yes, there was a time in particular, um, but some things have gotten lax, not necessarily because of Vatican II, though. People get that, like, way confused. Like, there was a train wreck that happened <clears throat> after Vatican II. Does that make any sense? So is, is it appropriate to say that the way it should be today is only the priest should give communion? That would, that would be my preference. That would be my preference. I, I don't speak for the church. The church has said they've given us permission, so I'm not going to be like, like I'm not going to like, <laughs> but I'm going to say that is my preference is absolutely to receive from the priest. Now, I'm not saying I won't receive from an extraordinary minister, because I will, right? Um, but that is my preference. That is my preference. So, yes? Um, extraordinary Minister? Yes. Yes. Um, are, so I believe you said the priests are not allowed, they're not supposed to be denying you in all the time. Correct. Or if you don't, or ignore. Um, are the others to just watch the priest? Extraordinary ministers? Yes. Supposed to? Absolutely not. Okay. They cannot. They cannot. If they do, if they do, it's actually kind of happened to me. The priest, I think, would have, but he was eventually, but I eventually just said, I got I got down to receive our Lord. This was that parish down in Dayton. He said, end up hand, please. And I said, I can't. I can't. And he's like, he's like, if, if I give you Jesus um, on the 10th time, I'm going to go have to sterilize my hands. My hands. Um, and I'm, you know, I think about this. I was like, you know what? People are like, well, what about sanitary things? I was like, okay, hold on. I just want to say it. <laughs> I have never flushed a toilet with my tongue. <laughs> not once, not once, never will. Like that's just that's gross, that's weird. But people flush toilets with their with their hand all the time, right? Like our hands are not necessarily the most clean things in the world. And when people receive in the hand, there's a really good chance that they touch their hands too, like the distributors. And so then those germs are also getting placed with everybody. So it's like actually when you think about it from that aspect. <laughs> Great question. Though. No, they're never allowed to. If they do, um, I'm not saying it's a good thing to like cause a scene, but when that happened to me, when I had a priest that was very, he was pretty cruel to me about it, I got up, I went back to the pew, and I prayed for that priest. I prayed for that priest. I didn't go bashing him to everybody in the world. It's not what I'm doing because I'm hoping in his conscience he's trying to do what he thinks is best, but I will also say that he was completely wrong. Completely wrong. So no, they're never allowed to. Never. And if they try to or say to, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't. So, great question. Yes, Andrew. So you keep saying that uh, um, you believe that you should only receive from the priest. Uh, what about for the deacon? Um, great question. Great question. So I, it's not necessarily that I believe. It's more of a preference. Like it's a strong preference. If I said I believe, let me retract that. Um, but it's more of a very, very strong preference. A deacon, they are an ordained deacon. They are not an ordained priest. 
their hands are not consecrated. However, I would say a deacon, I would prefer to receive from a deacon rather than a lay Catholic. Does that make any sense? Because there are some really awesome deacons. Right? So if there's like a priest and a deacon, so like, and they're both distributing, like, I'm, okay. You know, does that make any sense? Okay, great question. Yes, Ben? So I've heard before from Prod, um, some Protestants that, you know, the Catholic Mass is very structured and become boring at times, which I, I, I can understand from being an outsider. Yeah. So I'm not bashing any Protestant. Yeah. What is your take on the rigidity in the um, traditionalist of our Masses, and why is it so important that we do exactly what we do right. during the Mass time? Sure. So I will actually allude to something a little bit different. I would... Um, so you're, you're right of our, like, when I first started going to Mass with my wife before I became Catholic, it never once really dawned on me, like I'd heard of the real presence of Jesus, but it never actually dawned on me that that's just Jesus. Part of it is like, you just, I don't see, like, I don't, people don't act like that. Like, they don't act like it. Like, they just walk up and they come through. You know, they just walk up and they come through one after another. And people leave afterwards. You want to know something? You want to know who else left right after that, before Mass was ended? Judas. I don't want to be like that guy. <laughs> Seriously. Like, so when you see people leaving, like, early for Mass, it's like, little bro, like, you are taking your cues from nothing. Like, maybe not, they're not listening to Judas, but I'm like, he also did that. Don't do that. Like, don't do that. Um, but, so, there are some Masses where it's just like, there's so much reverence. Like, when I, I remember the first time I went to a Mass that was celebrated the ordinary form of the Mass in what's called Adorantum, where the priest is facing the tabernacle. This isn't a tabernacle, but it's a crucifix, right? And it makes sense, right? When the priest holds up our Lord, it helps to actually, the veil to be kind of torn and see that this is a sacrifice. The first time I went to, to a Mass that was, that was celebrated Adorantum, I cried. Because, like, it was just like this veil that was torn. So beautiful. And there are some masses that are celebrated in a certain way. When they've got the smells, the bells, right? It's just like, like you are, you can see that we're like this isn't like just about rigidity. This is like we love God, so like we want to give Him our best. The incense are good, right? We want our prayers raising up to heaven, right? And you can actually like there's, there's just you can connect the dots, right? You see people kneeling for Jesus. Like why are you kneeling if that's just bread? Oh, it's not just bread. It's Jesus. After those words, this is my body, this is my blood, Jesus Christ is truly present in every single particle of the consecrated host. He's present entirely in every species, so he's present in the chalice, and he's also present in the host, completely, the blood, soul, and divinity. So our externals, right, they actually can go a long way. And a lot of masses today are not celebrated with those. That makes any sense. Like, they're not. And a lot of people push back on those things, do so because they were taught differently. They were taught differently, and they were taught that these things are bad, and it's so rigid, and it's so hard, and stuff like that, right? We need to water it down. Well, I get, let me tell you something. Watered down Catholicism has at least two serious consequences. One, it puts <coughs> souls in danger. Two, it robs people of their chances to be truly forgiven. Jesus wants you to be a saint, right? Sometimes being a saint, oftentimes, most of the time, you gotta be a hero. Like not like in like, look at me, but like you stand up, you live your faith. Right? So those external things that are so beautiful and help just help us see it are very good, very powerful. So I would I absolutely like I am all about smells, bells, right? Altar rails or the the, the kneelers right in front. I want to go. In Shelby County, I think actually the majority of parishes do have them up front. I think the, the majority of them do. Couple, some do not, but the majority of them do, and they're awesome. And where those things are taking place, vocations are flourishing. Like, they really, really are. Again, it's a crisis of faith. It's a crisis of faith. And once people know it, they see the beauty, they recognize the beauty, they know that Jesus is present in the Eucharist, they want to run to him. Does that answer your question, Ben? Any other questions? I also to add to that, you're talking about a crisis of faith, but 
I think I would also add to that too, that's the crisis of the family. Yeah. Um, is that like a lot of times like teaching religion at a couple of parishes, you have a lot of kids that come in and they don't know the faith. The parents are relying on you yeah. to drive that in, uh, to, to teach them everything. And then if you teach them something that they don't like, they get mad. But yeah. generally it's like, I think you do a really good job of like explaining with your kids, like explaining them their faith. But um, it's important for like us, especially I know a lot of people are following the vocations of marriage to teach the kids the faith and then religion on that will also drive that instruction further that as parents and family like you do a good job of laying the foundation and then the other parts of of you know your parish priests and the people around you will help build them bricks and build the siding and make it a, a whole house structure so I think you're absolutely right brandon and actually I, to add to that most of the parents like maybe the reason why they're not involved or like they're not like it's like here this is your job brandon to teach my kids because they too have been robbed. Like they've been robbed through whether it be watered down catechesis or poor catechesis or flat out error. So it's like they, they don't really know yet either. So in those situations, you're right. How do we reach out to them? Again, you love them and you do what you can do. You do, you know, those conversions take place when you love them, when they see that you truly care about them. Like I care about you and I want you to, to say yes to the gift, right? I have not seen, ears not heard, but is prepared for those who love God. And I want you, I want you, I want you to, to love God. Because he loves you. He loves you. Great question, great quote. Anybody else, any other questions? Anything at all? Okay. So if I offended anybody during that topic, I had no intentions to. If I woke up hearts during that topic, I had total intentions to. <laughs> I had total intentions to, and that's okay. I said what I said primarily from a place of love. You guys can all be great saints. God has put you in this life at this time for a reason. For a reason. This group, Quo Bodies, is literally a beacon of light. It is phenomenal. Like, this has been also, like, keep, like, helping each other. Uh, there's this quote, iron sharpens iron. Keep walking with each other. Keep encouraging each other. Keep praying for each other. Keep extending out those friendships. Keep doing the good things that you're doing. And trust that the Lord is going to provide. He provides for faithfulness. He really does. I don't even know most of you guys. I, I did learn your names today. Forgot, forgot half of them. But I just want to say I'm super proud of this group. I'm proud of the good things that you're doing. Um, it's awesome that you guys are here. And if you continue to say yes to God's invitation, it will be the best thing you've ever, ever, ever done. He loves you beyond what you could possibly imagine. Beyond what you could possibly imagine. Again, I said this already. I'll say it again. If you are the only one who's ever created in all of human history, he would have went through everything just for you. He's not waiting for you with the club. He's waiting for you with a hug. That which is broken, he wants to heal. He wants to forgive us. We need to open up our hearts and run to him for the purpose of amendment and honesty. The church is a gift from God. Right? Live it out. Say yes to his invitation. And don't do it in a showy way because, like, look at me. Like, I'm Ben Boyd, and I'm just super awesome. <laughs> right? Do it because you love God. I know that's why you do it, Ben. I know that. You have a genuine heart. But I'm going to pick on you. I'm going to pick on you just because you're my friend, and you're an easy person to pick on. <laughs> Anybody else got any questions? Okay. Thank you guys so much for letting me speak tonight. Um, I hope something stuck with you. Know of my prayers for you. Please pray for me. And let's go ahead and close with one more prayer. Is that all right? I encourage everyone to look at either the crucifix or the image of divine mercy or both. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your church. 
thank you for your family, for our family. We thank you for your sacraments. We thank you for being truly present with us in the Eucharist. Lord, we ask that you tear down any walls that are holding us back. That you reach out your hand. And that you give us the strength to reach back and hold on. We pray for those who do not know you. We pray for every soul that will pass away today, tomorrow, and every day. That they will have the graces necessary for salvation. And the strength to say yes to those graces. We pray that all of us will turn to your infinite mercy. <clears throat> we pray for all of our priests. For our church. For the beacons of light. And we ask that a renewal and a revival of faith will occur and take place. We pray for those who persecute us, for they often persecute without knowing. And we ask that, they, that you will touch their heart and draw them too to the fountain of your mercy. We pray for all of the work that we do. We ask, Lord, that you accept our love as a sacrifice. And if you so wish, we place that sacrifice foot of the cross and we united with your sacrifice for us. We pray for the unborn. We pray that all people will come to respect, protect, and promote life. And Lord, help us just to know how much you love us. Glory be to the Father, Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everybody.